I'm about to try to crown the universe and to assemble this morning. My universe and the universe that the Lord has talked to me about and shown me about. And uh, I'm going to uh, talk to you about 70 years of things in my life and things I've seen, things I've gone through in the 21st century over your Pentecostal charismatic movement and where that has taken us and where we're headed and what's about to happen that probably you have no concept of, nor would I have had not the Lord gotten in a conversation with my guardian angel and they talked too loud and I overheard them. Maybe that was it. I'm not sure. But for whatever the reason, I know something. And I know that 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 God's about to make a move on this planet like we have never seen ever. It's unprecedented. It will shake the foundations of every institution. It will shake the foundations of every denomination. It will shake the foundations of everything that we know, the White House, the church house, every other house in the world will be shaken by what God is going to do. And he is in the makings of putting that chemistry together this year. And we will see the embryonic beginning of something unprecedented for 2,000 years in my understanding and what I see, what I believe. So let me give you a scripture. Again, I will talk to you about the 21st, or at least the first half of the 21st century overview of Pentecostal charismatic movement and, uh, and build on that. And maybe you'll understand in a minute why I'm using that scripture. One scripture, Matthew 13, 52, is an interesting scripture that has always fascinated me that fits the narrative of what I want to talk to you about this morning. I just don't want to talk to you about it. I want to set in motion something in the atmosphere and I want to say something to you that you can never unhear ever again. So here's what Matthew 13, 52 has to say. And Jesus said, I like that. That likes like no argument done. Your theology doesn't matter. And Jesus said, and Jesus said this, ever scribe or scholar who has become a disciple of the kingdom of God, that's us, is like a head of a household who brings out of his treasures things both new and things both old. Interesting. So what he's saying, if I can put it this way, uh, there is a present theological and spiritual uh, tension throughout Christendom and throughout the life of the church and throughout our life on earth. And it is, it is quite interesting to see the right, the left, the, the extremes on both sides of what God is doing, and it's like, it's really hard to catch God into a place where we understand and know what he's about to do next, because he does things old and new. He's the God of set boundaries old and new boundaries new. And so let me give you just uh, this, uh, this theological tension that we're living in, that you and I have been living in, and you and I don't understand. I, let me just give you a few, uh, there's the Old Testament and the theological tension between the New Testament. They're the same, but they're completely different. Have you felt that tension? There's a tension between the law and the spirit of God. There's a tension between um, uh, where the scripture talks about God raising up and giving teachers to the New Testament church. And then another scripture says, you need not that any man teach you with the spirit which you're by. And I'm going, would you make your mind up heaven? And there seems to be this tension. How about this? Proverbs 22, 28 says, Remove not the old landmarks or boundaries which your fathers have said. Then Isaiah says, wait a minute. Behold, I'm going to do a new thing. I'm going, which one of you guys, would you guys talk together? Because now at a 21st century church, we're kind of confused about old new stuff. And like, wow. Oh, so, so let me, somebody ask you this question. So is biblical truth in your spiritual reality absolute? In what you believe now, uh, and what we think now, is it that which part of it is old, which part of it is new? Well, where are you at in this tension? Where are you at in this sense of change and, and of holding the new and holding the old? I mean, it, it is a, it's a big, big, big thing. Where are you at in that? If so, if, if you believe uh, that you're in this biblical tension, you know, First uh, Peter puts it this way. So Second Peter, excuse me, one twelve says, be established in the, present truth, or the NAS puts it this way, the truth that is present with you. So it's a little confusing, but isn't God a little confusing? 
and mainly because he's God, and mainly because he has a better perspective of us, and mainly because he gets up in the morning just to mess us up, at least our theology and our religious stuff, because we're, if he doesn't, we will be stuck treading water, spiritual water, for the rest of our life without swimming in a stream that changes in velocity and speed from inch to inch to inch to generation to generation to generation. God's Spirit is a river. So what is my perspective about biblical truth? Is it absolute? Uh, I do believe that biblical truth, biblical truth is absolute, but I want you to get that. But, but, but the, the Spirit of God is a river. A river is absolute. But there's something about a river that's interesting. The unfolding of a river takes place depending on your perspective to that river. So truth takes place and, 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 you know, and, and, and takes on a different hue. Uh, not, not, that, not that truth, excuse me, but not that truth is not absolute. It's your perception of truth in time and space is what is not absolute. Let, let me say it better than that. So, example, the river of God is fluid. Do you believe that? All through the scripture, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Rivers of living waters. I mean, there's a river in heaven. River of God is all that's to be said about the flow of the Spirit of God. But have you ever watched a river? It is absolute, but depending on your position and your perspective and the flow and the velocity of that river, it changes appearance as it flows into new places. So the river's absolute, but your perception of that river in a time and a space is not absolute because you have to learn to change with the flow of that river because it takes you to new places and new scenery and new, and new things. It's the same river with different perspectives for different generations. Now, I'm not so much talking about doctrine. You could put that in there, I guess, if you want to. But how about this one? Uh, the, and by the way, here, here's the problem we have. We're in this river of God. And God's taken us somewhere generation. He's been 2,000 years, or 6,000 years in the Old Testament, 2,000 years since the New Testament, taking us somewhere generation, and the river is changing in velocity and speed. I mean, listen, water, when it travels down a river, never repeats the same space or ground ever. One cubit at a time, it changes. It never goes back and revisits the same place that it had his flowing from. We've got a problem. We're stuck. Not only we're stuck, but we're treading water, trying to stop uh, the, the sense of flow uh, in God's uh, 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 time and space that we live in because, because it's comfortable. You know, if you can tread, but if you, I don't know, I don't swim well, I don't tread water well, so I've just decided I'm, I'm just going to go with the river because the river's absolute, the river's God. Um, how I swim in it is up to me. So the same, how about this, the same is true of a baby in a womb. Yesterday's place of nourishment, if the baby stays too long in that water, will be the tomb for that baby. We didn't get that. It's going to get worse here. Yesterday's place of nourishment become, or can become, if the baby stays too long in that absolute place to where it should be, but if it stays too long there, more than nine months or so, that place of nourishment can become the baby's tomb. The church has stayed in the womb of perception and the womb of time and the womb of the spirit and the womb of our religion, the womb of, the womb of, our, our, of who and what we are and the womb of, of, of things. And, and we've stayed too long because there's been wonderful nourishment now. We don't have to do nothing but nourish the milk of the Holy Spirit. But if you stay too long there and don't grow in this river that I'm talking about, the place that was nourished for, nourishment for you will become your tomb and you will die. Nothing in God is stagnant. His name is light. He named himself 186,000 miles per second God. And we have the tenacity to say we're waiting on God. How dumb is that? Waiting on a God whose whole nature it is traveling at 186,000 miles per second. He is light, and that light and that day star has been brought to us and is shining in our life. So we, too, need to accelerate just a little bit beyond the norm and what we think we are and what it was yesterday. Yesterday was wonderful, wonderful, but yesterday's gone. And yesterday was yesterday. I'm at a new place in this river. 
you're at a new place in this river, and the next generation will be in another new place, and we don't understand any of that other than God is fluid, and from his throne flows a river to the nations, as Revelation says. The same with a caterpillar, you know that one, and a butterfly. How about that analogy? A caterpillar breaks through to a new stage of life to pollinate the earth. If it does not break through, now there's an absolute there, there's life there, yes there is, but there's a transition and a maturing of life that happens. You can't be a worm forever. You're called to be a butterfly. And religion will make you a worm forever. And you will crawl. Because you know what caterpillars do? They do not pollinate. They do not bring life. Bring life. Caterpillars live just to eat. I know you get it. But, so, and that's what a lot of Christianity has been in my life. It's all right, and they're supposed to do that. It's like, I got food, 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 more, 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 I, revelation, learning, learning, eat, 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 eat. But, they're, but when the caterpillar has enough, you know, nutrients and has enough food in them, has enough truth in them, their job is not just to stay in the cocoon of darkness are, are just a worm and eat, but it is to break through to a place where they bring life and pollination to the environment around them. The church is not called to be in the womb of darkness, just eating our own food, never changing. We're called to break through one of the most difficult things we can, and that is change from the darkness of a cocoon to the, to the labor and the hurt and the pain of breaking through the cocoon and taking on a new form of life and flying into the future with a different destiny and a different DNA than we had in the room. I, all this to say, and I'm going to stop with that. The church right now is pressing the edge of the cocoon. We are no longer the little grub worm that is waiting to be a butterfly. God is calling forth the church to pollinate the earth and to bring something new to the planet earth like we have never seen before. And that on is, is on this generation. It is upon this year, this time. It is on your lifetime. And the Lord said again to me, but this time I believed him this week when he said, didn't I tell you I was going to let you see it and be a part of it? And I said, yes, you did, Lord, but I think probably I thought you changed your mind or something. But he hasn't. I said, because I'm too old for that. And um, maybe I am. But at least I understand it. And I get to see a glimpse of it. So let me just give you just a short overview, of, uh, uh, as short as I know how to, be, uh, a short overview of where we've been as a charismatic Pentecostal church, which, by the way, is, one of the, is a very small portion of the church in the world. And I'll get to that. The metamorphosis of revival in the last half of the 21st century is well understood by me. I get it because I've lived that. And actually, through nearly 10 moves of God, 10 global moves of God have happened in the last half of the 21st century, beginning around the 1940s all the way to where we're at now. And I have really been privileged to be a part of all of those 10, all the way back to 1955 when I had my little mandolin. Uh, uh, on the radio with my dad, uh, uh, ministering at nursing homes and, and jails and doing ministry and, and uh, Pentecostal Jesus' name, holiness, which meant we were people that nobody else wanted to associate with uh, because of who we were so legalistic. I couldn't wear shorts because I was, you know, because that was considered showing my nakedness. And God knows we don't want anybody lusting after my skinny little white legs. But, but anyway, it was like, it's like, you know, we were really legalistic, you know. My sisters couldn't wear makeup, neither could I. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I, we had to keep her hair, had to bowl cut her hair. If your hair tucks your ear, oh, boy, that was bad. Jesus saves, and Jesus saves, and Jesus shaves. That was sort of our theology. My, my, none of my sisters could wear makeup. None of my sisters could wear short dresses. I couldn't go to gym. I couldn't go to school and be a part of anything that was a part of that because I was separated in all holiness 
bubble unto God, and there was nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying that is where I began in 1955, and here it is now, 2024. But so let me just give you a run through the real. I promise I'll just, I'll just drop in just for a minute on 10 of the Pentecostal uh, uh, charismatic, at least half of the 21st century uh, charismatic movement. And what we've been through, and I believe where we're going, is a giant leap from where we've been. You can put all 10 of those together, and it's not going to compare to this one amazing thing that God is about to do globally with the global church. So how about this one? From the, I'm going to talk about the late 40s to 50s phenomenon uh, that was in the Pentecostal charismatic movement, which is uh, the uh, signs and wonders cocoon. I'm going to use the cocoon and the butterfly as an analogy to these different moves of God because that's what happened. There's the cocoon, then there's a butterfly, then there's another cocoon, and we keep being transformed into his image through different moves of God. So, and I'm going to talk to you, I'm just going to mention to you this, the conception, the contributions, and the problems that were created during each of these moves of God. I've seen the conception and the contribution, been part of a lot of that, and I have watched and been a part of the problem. So at the peak of Pentecostal power and the gifts of spirit and the power of God was in the late 40s and 50s. Men like Gordon Lindsay, I don't know if you know who he was, he's the head of uh, Christ for the Nations, which I cut my teeth on all of his books. You should get his book sometimes called Old Testament Characters, New Testament Characters. As a teenager, I read it, and it so impacted my life. He passed away in the 60s. A.A. A. A. Allen, I was in his meetings at six years old, the great A.A. A. Allen, the tent revival, where lame walk and the blind side saw miracle after miracle. His prophetic gift was amazing. William Branham, I was not with him, but I around him, but I was connected to one of his associates, uh, very closely. Oral Roberts, who was kind of the father of the healing ministry, I grew up with that Oral Roberts anointing. If you know what that is, that was an extraordinary miracle that happened, and tens of thousands of documented healings happened during this Signs and Wonders cocoon in the 40s and the 50s, which was, by the way, an afterbirth of the whole Azusa Street revival, which began in the early 1900s, and which played through the next two or three decades all the way up to the 50s. The problem. Now, that's the good thing. Here's what I'm going to say to you. I'm going to say this ahead of time to say that we're going to, we're going to talk about new things. We're going, to come back. we're going to dip back in. God's going to take the best of all of these 10 moves and put it into one thing and add some, add some icing on the top of all of it. We're going to see the best of the best, the best of the best, and stuff you've never even imagined you have seen before. And I'm going to say some things to you today that I'm going to take a risk on. You're going to say, that's not God. But I have no problem with you being wrong today. Because I know what I'm talking about. I've seen it. So here's the problem. It was the Pentecostal movement was marked by legalism. Legalism is a strict adherence to the letter of the law with no, there's just no grace for that, rather than the spontaneity and the grace of the Spirit. It was do's and don'ts. It was not grace bait. It was inflexible, and it was a do and don't time in the church. And I think we needed that. I don't know. Maybe we needed that. I'm not sure. But, boy, that was a very difficult time. I grew up there in that time, and um, as I said uh, many times to you, it was both wonderful and it was both terrible. It was so wonderful that I ran away from home at 13 to get away from it and uh, decided at one time I was going to be a Catholic priest uh, just because I like man in black. But anyway, so, oh, come on. So anyway, no, two, no, so that's number one. Let me, let me get through this. I've got something to say. Number two is the charismatic cocoon. So you have the P Pentecostal signs and wonders, 40s, 50s phenomena uh, uh, cocoon. Uh, which, by the way, my dad had amazing miracles. I saw miracles. We never went to the doctor. He healed us. I was healed so many times. I saw healing as a kid. It was just amazing. So, anyway, but number two was the charismatic cocoon. Early in the, it was early to late '60s phenomenon, and the conception and contribution was this. It reintroduced the Holy Spirit to mainline churches. Most mainline churches treated us like we were the plague. They 
By the way, we were not just Pentecostal. We were Jesus' name, holiness, Pentecostal, and all that and more. That's who we were. But the charismatic movement in the early 60s reintroduced the Holy Spirit to the mainland church, and it came in a package that was more culturally relevant. And I know people don't like it when you say that. It's the gospel, it's the word, it's always King James. It will always be King James. I don't like NIV. That's now I'm vineyard, we used to call it. But it was not, but, but it came in a way that was acceptable. And it came through a guy named Dennis Bennett in California, an Episcopal priest in the 60s, who began to open his church to young people. And there was a cross denominational outpouring that began to happen that had marks and smells of the Pentecostal legalism, without the legalism, there was a little more grace-based, but it carried some of the same anointing and some of the name, same gifts of the Spirit. It was a knee-jerk reaction to extreme Pentecostalism and legalism, and the pendulum swung from different ways. For instance, you like this. Just terminology meant something. Now, I was raised in this first Pentecostal Science of Wonders, cocoon, as one thing, the Spirit of God is the Holy Ghost. It's always been the Holy Ghost, and don't you not call it the Holy Ghost, and I never liked that because that was a contradiction of terms to me. How can a ghost be holy? I never liked that. But that was the, that was the, that was a package it, it came in. So, so in this, in this charismatic movement, not only things change, but terminology changed. So there was this, 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 uh, it was no longer the Holy Ghost. Now, the church knew him as the Holy Spirit. And if you was ever around Catholic Cumin, you would be called the Holy Spirit. Some of you don't know who Catherine Cumin is. But it was more culturally uh, relevant. So the pendulum swing to Holy Ghost, to Holy Spirit, and how about no longer you are speaking in tongues. Now, see, God's not offended if you change the language as long as you don't change the spirit. But we're all about language. So it was changed from Holy Ghost to Holy Spirit and then speaking in tongue to praying in a heavenly language. Now, now I remember thinking when I, when I met this charismatic cocoon, I, I thought, you know what, I never, I, I don't lie, I'll never speak in tongues, but talking in a heavenly language, I'm in on that one. And it's the same thing. God gives, a, he sells the same stuff with different packages. And we're so packaging sensitive, and we're so marketing stupid, we'll buy it. Or we won't buy it because we don't like the way it sounded before. And so there was a thing we used to do in this first Pentecostal cocoon called being slain in the spirit. And I remember that. Oh, Josh, there's meetings where half where everybody's in the spirit, out cold on the floor, slain the spirit, looks like a grave, slain the spirit. Well, there had to be a, an uptick on, on, on describing what that meant in a way that contemporary to, to, to this particular generation in the 60s. So they quit calling it slain the spirit to resting in the Lord. And I thought, wow, I don't want to be slain the spirit, but I don't mind resting in the Lord. It's funny how, see, the Lord really knows how to do it. So we went from, went from Pentecostal country songs to corporate worship in the spirit, to singing in the spirit. Like, we don't want to do Jesus on the main line, tell him what you want. Three chord turnaround, fourth chord was the devil. <laughs> Jesus on the main line, that was our favorite song. Tell him what you want if you want that Holy Ghost. Tell him what you want, and my hammer go, oh, and fall on the floor. And, and her hair bun would fall over the side, and then she'd get up and start running around the room, and Bobby Pins would call her Ninja Ruth. Bobby Pins flying, sticking in the wall because the Holy Ghost was on her. So we don't do that no more because that's not culturally cool, so we call it just resting in the Spirit of God, just floating in the Spirit. It's interesting. God's a wonderful Father. He just gives you the same stuff and changes the label. I just love that. But anyway. Country songs to corporate worship. The problem, let me hurry through them too. It was marked by self-indulgement, gross immaturity, and an overemphasis on grace. And God had to transition again. Number three, the Jesus movement cocoon, late 60s to the early 70s, conception, 
contributions, it introduced the Holy Spirit to a generation of troubled young hippies whom I was a radical, runaway from home, rebellious hippie that did not want to do Pentecost anymore. And if Jesus ever liked rock and roll, I would work with him. I'd made that decision. So God introduced Holy Spirit to a bunch of long-haired, arrogant, smart aleck hippies like me in my teenage years and others in their teenage years. And what that brought forth through Chuck Smith and a church called Calvary Chapel in, in Southern California, uh, out of that there was a birth of rock gospel in groups like uh, uh, Fifth Day from, gosh, I can't remember all the groups that came through there. Andre Crouch was born out of there, and some more rock groups were coming out. I mean, just, it was like, oh, my gosh. It was no longer three-chord turnaround. There were actually minors and seventh chords, which we know God doesn't like. I mean, I, I was taught that in the Pentecostal church. I don't know if you grew up Pentecostal. Day. I was taught in the Pentecostal church that minors, like the Jewish minor key, they was in, de, 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 de. It was the devil. We could not play bar chords because that was the devil. You had to be open, eat, eat, eat. It had to be a three-chord turnaround, and it had to sound bad to be God. I was done with that and this Jesus move of cocoon. And so when that came along, rock gospel, I was in. I got me some bell bottoms and some hip huggers and some sandals. My dad thought, my dad turned me over to the devil for the destruction of my other clothes. But I, I said, I, I'm done with that. Matter of fact, forget that. Jeez, I think it comes Jimmy. I don't know where Jimi Hendrix come from. I thought, but I don't know if you even like him, Lord, but would you help him? Because I like him. And I like, I, I like, guitar. I like, I like what I hear. And so we went from silk shirts to platform shoes to long hair with an attitude. And God anointed us. We totally terrified the church. I mean, literally terrified. They were petrified of us. I went to one, we took our, we took our uh, rock group at the time called Sounds of Joy to one church when we left, they opened up all the windows of the church to blow out the devils we left behind. Maybe that's why the song, Eat the Devil in Disguise. Maybe that was Elvis. That's another one. But anyway. Am, am, am I having fun or are you guys just putting up with me? Okay, okay, let, let me hurry up here. Here's the problem. Marked by a spirit of independence and lawlessness began to come into the Jesus movement cocoon. I found myself there as well. Unwillingness to give up the old lifestyles and embrace a relevant gospel became a problem in our life. So God brought another one, number four. The Word of Faith cocoon, late 60s and early 70s. Conception contributions came through Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland, Jerry Savell, Charles Capps, who I minister with all, the, all those guys, knew all those guys. Love Charles Capps, who wrote the book, The Tongue, A Creative Force, if you remember that, in the 60s. It was a 32-page book that sold millions of copies because the church had never knew the tongue was a creative force. The tongue, that is, a faith. It emphasized the power of faith that comes through the spoken word, especially Kenneth Hagin. Kenneth Hagin was all about the way I read his book, I Believe in Visions, when I was 20-something years old, and it totally revolutionized nice my life because he was a man of faith. His only message is Mark eleven twenty three. Remember that one, David? Remember that one, Mark eleven twenty three. Who you know, speaking to this mountain, be there removed, shall not doubt in his heart that God raised him. It is all about the word of faith. So the word of faith, the emphasis is one, you know, how you said it and what you said it, it came through the spoken word. You couldn't do negative confessions. You couldn't say you couldn't say, I'm catching the flu, you had to say I'm catching a healing. I think we need to bring that one back. It couldn't say, man, that guy's killing me. It's that guy, that guy's just stirring me up the lies. Which means I still want to kill him, but my confession's right. 
It couldn't be, I'm catching a cold. We could not say that. We had to catch a healing. Not, I'm not catching a cold. Bless God, I'm catching a healing. All those snots still running all the way down my shirt. Because it's not what look like that matters. It's what you said that matters. And we couldn't say we're going to have a retreat. We couldn't have retreats. We had to have charges. And there was nothing wrong with that because our, our language was wrong and our language was being recrafted. But the problem, and let me go through this, was presumption again. And spiritual pride began to come in. I remember... Uh, Pastor, associate pastor in a church in 73, maybe, 74. Anyway, this my secretary named Martha, who's passed away a long time ago. She, she heard uh, Jerry Savelle uh, and, and helped build their church. Actually, he and Charles Capps and Kenneth Copeland. And, and he came and preached on faith, the word of faith, and bless God. If you think you're going blind, you have glasses, just believe God and get rid of those glasses. Well, Martha was halfway blind. And Martha heard that message Sunday morning, and since I had a little bit of understanding under my belt that she didn't have, I said, maybe you should start with just one lens, Martha. She didn't. Well, we got a call from Martha after she left the church where she took her glasses off and where she had wrapped her car around a tree. So she went from glasses or no glasses to a car wreck. And so I, I'm, what I'm trying to say, it got a little extreme and things got out of hand. And it's like, it was like faith was great, confession was good. It was what we needed, but pride and spiritual pride and presumption rule. Number five, kingdom now cocoon. I wasn't quietly fully a part of that uh, as a 70s phenomena that had to do with Earl Park and one of the facilitators of the kingdom now messages and others who talked about the Manifest of Sons of God messages. You probably never heard anybody talk about that. I met two people who I knew were Manifest of Sons of God who actually could travel, spirit travel places and come back. One of them was a mentor of mine who would not believe, I would not believe, that you just would not believe what I've seen and what I saw with him. It was amazing. But they established the reality that the kingdom is now. In other words, now is a kingdom. It's not about the rapture. It's not about the next coming or the second coming. The kingdom is now, and we couldn't even sing, I'll fly away. We had to sing, I'm here to stay. So the emphasis, the theological shift from all that it was in the past of the sweet being by and by to go to heaven uh, was no. It's a sweet, I'm here to stay on earth because there's no physical rapture, the Antichrist. Um, you know, and the mark of the beast is here. And so the sons and daughters of God are not to go anywhere, to be caught away, where to stay here to rule and reign and build a kingdom for his second coming up on the earth. It too was met with pride, a super spiritual elitism. And a lot of the people who were in that, or all of them I remember, all dead. Quite didn't work out for them. It was perspective at the time, and I get the theological bent, but it was overcooked and overdone, and God had to move the river down the road. Number six, this one still makes me laugh. The number six move of God in the 70s, in the mid-70s, was the spiritual warfare and deliverance cocoon. Jesus. Everybody had at least a gaggle of demons especially the ministry, according to the congregation. And a guy named Bill uh, Hammond, who wrote a, a book called Pigs in the Parlor. First time I read that, I heard, uh-huh, you just dated yourself with me. Pigs in the Parlor. Derek Prince wrote the book, who is an amazing man of God, uh, Breaking Curses. I remember in the 80s reading Derry Prince's book, and I'm reading it, I'm driving my car, I'm in the streets of L.A., and I go, oh, my God, I'm breaking curses. I break the curse and looked up and rear end a Mercedes. God gave me an opportunity to break a curse. And I don't see anything wrong with that because there were deliverance sessions that were happening because coming out of some of these things we'd been in, we'd picked up a lot of junk, and, and there really were an impression, but it was too much. It was like... Stomping, shouting, shofar blowing, karate, charismatic, fanatic, crazy stuff going on. That, geez, there was a devil and every cat that lived. 
As a matter of fact, <laughs> everybody had a demon, devil behind every door. Speaking of cat, there was a guy named Richard who's not alive now, and uh, during this time uh, in the 70s, phenomenon of spiritual warfare and deliverance, uh, who had this special gift of deliverance and discernment and warfare. I remember him coming to my house, and he, he said, and he's sitting in the room, and my cat walks. I have a cat named Sniffles. I named her Sniffles. And he said, as a cat walked by, he says, uh, you need to get rid of that cat. I go, why? He said, she has a demon. I said, what? Sniffles has a demon? She sniffles. Now, if her name was Scuttle, that would be different or something, but she sniffles. Now, I know she'd been walking around, and she'd met a couple of Tomcats, and the Tomcats she used to walk around wasn't the one she was with now, but that's, 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 that's fine. I know she had babies, and I knew that. I knew it wasn't things went on the up and up, but she still didn't have a demon. And he said, no, Sniffles, you've got to get rid of Sniffles. <laughs> So he proceeded to cast the devil out of Sniffles. Sniffles looked at me and went, Meow. She was catatonic. <laughs> but the, see, I believe in casting out devil. Demons, but the church service in that time became more about the devil than about God. It's not what about was God here, is that there's devils here. Oh man, I remember with a group in that during that time, there's this guy who 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 was overweight, like really bad, it was gonna kill him, we were trying to help him out, and we was trying to cast so somebody cast a spirit of glut now there. And said, That's fine, I got the word of God. We've been trying everything, it wasn't working, he was going, ah, you know, and so she said, it's gluttony, it's a spirit. We cast the spirit of gluttony. Spirit of gluttony come out. And the guy, just like his face lit up, the anointing came on. He's like, wow, amazing. And we're walking out of the room, and the guy goes, excuse me, you got a cookie. <laughs> I go, well, that didn't work very well. <laughs> but the problem, let me move on. There's only six, I get just a few more. The problem was marked by deception and an unhealthy emphasis on the devil instead of an emphasis on Jesus. Now, they all had a, they all had a sound bite of truth in them, but again, the river was flowing, and they were staying at the same place all the time, and they were not seeing the transition of what God was doing because God is so wonderful as you are as a parent to your child that you will take them through child, through young stage, through adulthood, through, through transitions in what is what is true is true, but what their perception of truth was as a child is not the same perception they have now. So it's not that truth is not absolute. Your perception of truth and your growth sprout is changeable. Truth is absolute, but you're not. No, your perception of God or what God's doing is not, because it's from glory to glory. It's linear. God's linear. A river is linear. Out of his throne flows a river of living water. This is a linear. It is changing. And by the way, water purifies itself every few feet, they say, when it flows. So a water, a river that flows is pure. We're not a pond. We're not called to be a pond. We're not called to be just a well. We're called to be a people of God who out of our belly, Jesus said, will flow rivers of living waters. That's the way the world changes. That's the way we change. As, as the waters flow through us, it refreshes us. It cleanses us. It takes us to new places, new scenery, new things come our way. And that's where we're at right now. I'm done with being just a lake or a pond or a little puddle. I and you are set for a time and history where God has called the church to be a river and not an island of water to itself. Number seven, I'll stay here just for a minute. The shepherding cocoon, which I was not so much a part of, but has some of my best friends were there. The 80s, excuse me. Conception and contribution, there were Bob Mumford, 
who I loved, was a friend of mine, Derek Prince, Charles Simpson. You won't know none of these names. These were big global, international names. Actually, actually Bob Mumford and I were teaming up to travel Europe together. He was as the shepherding, um, uh, what a wonderful Bible teacher, and I was a prophetic guy that was going to rejoin and put all this together for us. Anyway, it didn't work out. He got sick, and uh, the river went somewhere else with me. Uh, but anyway, these were wonderful men, especially Charles Simpson, who's passed away. But up to this point, everything that was done seemed to be right in the eyes of the people, and this shepherding movement thought there needed to be some order into the church. And so they need to bring an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastors, and teachers, and there need to be a point, there need to be a, a pyramid of leadership, and there need to be a top-down governmental apostles, evangelist, pastors, and teachers, and there need to be a return to a biblical authority and submission um, uh, to curb the spirit of independence that was rampant through the Pentecostal movement, through the Jesus movement, all the way through the Kingdom Now movement. Now, it was well received at the time. But it was a return to biblical submission and to the Word of God and to a spirit of independence that infiltrated the church. I want to emphasize that again. And, but it got out of hand because here's how it got out of hand. If you weren't living there, you would have known. Everything was about who's your shepherd, who's your covered. It had to do with covered. Like who's, you, there's just a few of you who lived through that. Who, it, it, it was on, all these movements were global. And what I was doing in some of them, I don't know, but I was always there. But this one I didn't like. Who's your shepherd? Who you submitted to? Who's in your downline or your upline? And I go, is this Amway or the church? If it is, let's call it I am the way. Let's change it or something. So decisions were made by leaders, and these were great leaders. I remember Derek Prince and I did our last meeting together in Florida. Actually, before he passed away, it was the most amazing. Now, I don't put him in any negative category, or Charles Simpson. Yeah, I'm just saying they were ahead of a movement who actually apologized on some later about how they overdid the whole submission and authority because here's where it went. It's usually not the leaders that take it to a crazy place. It's the people under them that didn't hear clearly what Spirit was saying through the leaders that took it to a stupid place because of immaturity. But who's your shepherd? Who are you submitted to? Decisions were made for leaders about private matters in their own family, and the pyramid top down was man and woman on the bottom. Women were not allowed to preach. Women were not allowed to speak in the church. Women were not allowed to do... Women were not allowed to take authority over their husbands, except at home. And restraints were put on women that made me so mad. That's when I decided, and the Lord spoke to me, you're to be a defender of women. You're Moses, and you're to fight off the shepherds who are trying to keep the women from drinking from the well. And that book of Exodus where Moses fought off the shepherds, the leaders who tried to keep the women, the, the daughters, uh, uh, from feeding the sheep. Decisions were made that were terrible. The problem is a spirit of control emerged that stifled individual creativity and eliminated women and put women in the family on a lower level. Men ruled. They didn't understand that Jesus, that they didn't understand. Somehow they missed the point that Jesus, when he died, didn't say, behold, I give you power over all the power of your wife. He didn't say, I give you power over all the power of your congregation. I give you power over all the power of the church. Jesus never gave his disciples when he died power over people. He said, behold, I give you power over demons and evil spirits and healings and things that hurt people. And somehow we have still to learn that when Jesus never gave us a multi-level marketing downline, top pyramid down to the bottom thing where someone rules over someone. I don't like ruling over people because Jesus has never called me to rule over people. He's called me to rule over things that hurt people, to rule over the, the anguish in their life, to rule over the demon spirits in their life, and the sickness and disease that have, that have ravaged their life. That's what we're commissioned to do. And that's our downline. Our downline is not people. Our downline is demons and sicknesses and disease. 
we should be there and they should be here. So, that passed. In the 80s and 90s phenomena, the prophetic cocoon emerged, and that's where Larry found his most fun. It reinstated the value, the value of prophetic gifting in the church. And what I mean by that is I was prophetic as a child. I had a word of knowledge as a child. My dad had an amazing prophetic gift. But God knows back when you're Pentecostal in the 50s, if it's a word from God, it's got to be loud. You know what I mean? God talk loud. If it was a whisper, it was a devil. Not only was, did God talk loud in the church, it was just, it was like, it was crazy. It was crazy strong. It was crazy uh, in so many ways. Uh, it was wonderful in so many ways because it introduced the prophetic back into the church, but it was so, uh, it was so heavy. It was so, it was just, it just had a feel to it that you were being talked down to and it was condescending. And most of the prophetic words are, are, are the words of knowledge. Well, yep, I saw you at that nightclub out there running around, messing around. I'll tell you right now, the Spirit of the Lord says, you're going straight to hell and split it wide open. You know, it's like, God. That's completely the opposite of what Paul said, edification, exhortation, and comfort should be the equal of prophecy. But anyway, it didn't matter. That's what the prophetic move was about. So in the 80s and 90s, when that came, not, not that these guys were a part of that, but they were a group of guys. I was one, me. I wrote the book, User-Friendly Prophecy, which I was excoriated by the prophetic community for calling prophecy user-friendly. Because the publisher in 92 that wanted to publish my book, User-Friendly Prophecy, I said, I want to call it User-Friendly Prophecy. It was a new word. I kind of liked that. Anyway, and I thought prophecy should be user-friendly. Prophecy should be a friendly gift, not an unfriendly one. It's because Paul said it's to edify, exhort, and exhort the church and to, and to build up the church. And, and that's what, it's to comfort. Prophecy is for comfort. The publishing company said to me, we don't like the title. You'll never sell a book of that book on that title. That title is not church worthy. It's not church relevant. We want to call it Mysteries of the Prophetic Unveiled. I said that is exactly the complete opposite of what the book is trying to say. I will throw it in the trash if you change the name. And they said, okay. And I said, good. And I meant it. I'm going to do it. I will not call it. Myst I'm trying to demystify the prophetic so that everybody, because Paul said, you may all prophesy, not just a few wild-haired, bug-eyed guys that, were, that have just gotten back from a third heaven visitation somewhere is going to tell you what's going on. It's like it was, it was so done. I grew up with spooky prophecies. I don't want, I want authentic. I want real with the love of God. To, I, I, I want it to be friendly. Well, they relented. And it's still called user friendly prophecy. I won that one. But boy, was I excoriated. Wow. People that were my friends were mad at me. How could you use a worldly Colloquialism like that on the gift of prophecy. I was thinking, how could you even be in the ministry? But I didn't say it because I'm user friendly. We're done there. So there was Bill Hammond, who was a friend of mine. Bill Hammond and I did our first conferences in the 80s together, the great prophet. Kim Clement and and John Paul Jackson, Jim Gall, Bob Jones, Paul King, Rick Joyner, me, a bunch of guys, we all had that, but we all, we all kind of stepped into that, more, into that more culturally relevant prophetic ministry globally. And listen, everybody in the world wanted you. If you have good things to say to people, everybody wants you. But if you have nasty prophetic things to say to people, you're probably not going to get a lot of invitations. Because the prophetic people... Prophetic people got really weird. Let me tell you this one. Rick Jones said it was, Rick, so it was at a church in Texas. And back in the days where they were trying to make the transition from bad prophetic to nice prophetic and from mean prophets to better looking prophets. And this guy stood up in a church and, and said, oh God, I've seen a million things. He was stood up in a church and said, thus saith the Lord God. And he gave this excoriating word to the church. 
Let's say he's removed your candlestick and the anointing is going to leave this church. And in three years, the doors are going to be shut down. So the pastor is conferring on the stage with the associate. This is where the Lord and the pastor has lived long enough to think, no. So he says, sir, will you stand up? So the prophet stood back up and he said, that word you just gave, I'm the pastor, I'm the, I'm the shepherd of this flock, and I don't believe that was the word of the Lord. And I just want to tell you, you need to sit down, that was the word, not the word of the Lord. He sat down, the place is dead silent. The prophet gets back up and said, Thus saith the Lord God, it was me too. How can you argue with that? Except sit down. Yeah. Crazy, crazy. I, I, I know I'll tell you, I was in, was in Eugene, Oregon somewhere, and a guy from San Diego, California, heard about my prophetic conference I was doing there for the first time in a denominational church, and he drove all the way from San Diego with the word of the Lord to me. He sent a, a message that he had the word of the Lord, the earth-changing uh, word of the Lord this prophet was going to give me. And it's like, uh, and, you know, so, I mean, the way I sell prophet, P-R-O-F-I-T, that's a better way to spell it. But by prophet, it should profit your soul. And so, but he's coming, I'm thinking he's going to come and encourage me. So he comes, and they say he's here in the meeting. I think he's going to meet with me after the meeting's over. And, uh, and you know, I want to hear what he has to say. You know, gosh, what would you not want to hear from a San Diego prophet? So, uh, you know, the sun always shines there. The water's warm. It's like, they've got to be good. They've got to be cool. The guy probably going to come in on a surfboard. And so... I'm so, <laughs> so I'm in the middle of my messages, and he stands there and walks right straight up to me. And he said, uh, God sent me here from San Diego. I thought, oh, here we go. Here we go. God sent me from San Diego to give you the word of the Lord. It's going to change your life. Angel Lord visited me and said to give you this word. And I'm thinking, man, who? I said, okay. He said, the Lord says to tell you, Larry Randolph, bada boom, bada bang. I said, what else to say? He said, nothing. <laughs> but bada boom, bada bang. So I said, so I'm trying to get out of this. And I said, so you sure, are you not dyslexic? They was bada, bada bang, bada boom, boom? He goes, no, no, it was bada boom, bada bang. I said, not bada bang, bada boom. He goes, no, bada boom, bada bang. Now he's mad at me. Because I'm trying to change the prophetic narrative here. It wasn't bada boom, bada bang, bada bang, bada boom, bada bang, bada bang, bada bang, bada bang. <laughs> Then he said, okay, he's going to, he's going to top it off. He said, the Lord told me to give you a Rolex watch. That'll, that'll tell you something. I thought, wow. Okay. It's bada boom, bada bang. I'm, I'm fine with that. <laughs> I didn't mean to go here. This just hit me. I have a thousand story. But anyway, so, so I said, I'll go with that. So, so he pulls out this goal. He said, he said, I drove. I pulled it out of my safe up here. And the Lord said to put it on your arm because bada boom, bada bang, it's your time. I said, at least you got an extra word, and it's your time. That was an easy one. So I put it on, and he said, wow, I never had a Rolex. I come from Arkansas. We went to Walmart and got a Timex. And so now I'm in doing a conference uh, I'm in North Carolina somewhere, and I'm at the mall in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I go through it, and I thought I'd have the Rolex clean. So I take the Rolex into this, <laughs> to this Rolex shop there, and I said, sir, I got this Rolex. Would you clean? And he said, sure. Uh, let, me, let me look at it. He looks at it, and he looks at it for a while, and he said, sir, do you know this is not a real Rolex? <laughs> bad boom, bad boom. <laughs> I said... I said, like, not like, real, real? He goes, no. I said, like, is it like, is it like at least a knockoff, like a Mexican knockoff or something, you know? He goes, it's probably the worst I've ever seen. <laughs> I've had prophetic people prophesy me to the North Pole while the next one to the South Pole. If I did everything prophetic people told me to be, I'd be living in 20 universes in 10 countries, wearing seven different pieces of clothing with different ministries, and being a rock star that had a country hat on. I don't know. It was like, gosh, I've heard so much stuff. 
because, by the way, I didn't mean to go, but I'm going to end that. The Lord called me to de the prophetic. You may all prophesy. And by the way, said when you prophesy, try using your own voice. Nobody wants to hear you prophesying Mickey Mouse. It is your voice, your breath, your understanding, your connection with God. Let it be filtered through your terminology. That's the way God, he made us unique filters that way. Anyway, I parked there too long because, as you tell, I got a bone of contention on that one right now. But I got to move on because I feel that prophetic thing emerging again, but it's got to be, got to be different. Number nine, we've got two more only. By the way, the word of, oh, excuse me, the problem, it wasn't pastor friendly. Oh, you're saying that just because you're pastor now. Partly because the Lord took me off the global mark for, for decades and decades and said, I'm going to really hurt you now. I'm going to put you in pastor and have prophetic people prophesy over you. Oh, get in there and get a good word. Because it was not pastoral friendly. Spirit of independence, not relational. There was a prophet worship going on. And by the way, the word of knowledge was so prized over the gift of prophecy. And the Lord really talked to me about that. The word of knowledge is a diagnostic gift. And you can have a word of knowledge, so do witch doctors. You can have a word of knowledge. You can tell somebody something they know. You need to tell something to somebody they don't know about what God's about to do in their life. They know they have a problem and they know they have a disease. Nothing wrong with that. Word of knowledge should be a diagnostic gift so that you can prescribe a prophetic medicine for their life of grace and healing in their life. But the word of knowledge, God, and I met some of the guys you would not believe. I've, been, I've done ministry with guys. I've done a little bit of this guy's work. We get their, their the names, their birthdays, get, get, get alphabetical order lined up. Every person lined up is an alphabetical order with no, not ever saying their names to, to the kids. And so, but, but it got, word of knowledge started being prized and praised. And nobody was getting a projected word of prophecy. There was a word of knowledge worship. Do not go there again. We can't go there. Word of knowledge should be died. That's what a doctor does when he tells you, this is what I think is wrong. This is what I think. But a doctor that doesn't prescribe a prophetic prescription is not a good doctor. Go to a doctor's office. He tells you every time, here's the word of knowledge, man. You, you, you got leukemia. If he doesn't give you medicine for it, you know, he says, come back in six months. He tells you again, you got leukemia. And so you tithe to him for three or four times, and then you don't get healed. There's no prescription. Every word of knowledge should be followed by prescription. Unless there are knockoffs. I was in uh, Scotland, Eyemouth, Scotland. I was in Eyemouth, Scotland, and a... The church in Switzerland, I believe, was so angry at what was going on there with the prophetic movement, or at least the high church, not all the church, wonderful people in Switzerland. We had vineyards in Switzerland at the time, the church I was based out of. And so they got a hold of a news reporter to come to sneak in and write a negative article about the prophecy and the American prophecy that was in and uh, Scotland and <clears throat> England that was demonic. Now, I love this part of the prophetic. I'm 30 seconds into standing up. I had not greeted anybody, not seen anybody, and I turned to this guy in a word of knowledge. I said, you're from Switzerland. You're here to discredit the word of knowledge. Your name is, I gave him his name, and God is not happy with you. The guy, you thought you had shot him with a gun. He hit the floor. The whole thing, he recanted. The whole thing was writing on the, I mean, I love the word of knowledge when it's at that level. But at the same time, we went and I went and prayed for him and ministered to him. Don't know if he became a believer. So the word of knowledge is powerful. I don't want to demean that. But stop just looking for word of knowledge for information. Kim Clement told me the first time we met, he said, Larry, when I've been in the, the backwoods of Africa, and I've met witch doctors who had a better word of knowledge than I do. They could tell me my grandmother's age and birthday. But they could never prophesy the goodness of God over my life. Third wave uh, cocoon peaked at the 80s and early 90s, conception contribution. 
I returned to the power of God in the form of healing um, and miracles. I renewed authority over sicknesses and disease, mainly John Wimber, who was a Quaker, by the way, at the time, started the Vineyard Movement, whom I connected with. He made healing respectable. And interesting thing, the whole Vineyard Movement had what they called the Quaker anointing. You know what the Quaker anointing was? The Quaker anointing. John Wimber, John Wimber was John, get the, John Wimber was the, was the music producer for the Righteous Brothers. He wouldn't even say it when God took him. His wife, Carol, was a Quaker and went to the Quaker church. You know what the Quaker church is? The Quaker church was a church that quaked. When God would come, they would go, <laughs> and they quaked. They were called Quakers. John Wimber didn't even, never been to church. He was, he was managing the Righteous Brothers and recording them. You've lost that love and feeling. Now, anyway, that's the Righteous Brothers. You have to be my age to get that. Now it's gone, gone. That could be a Christian song. But anyway. And so he goes to his wife to uh, a Quaker church. He is so non-churched. And we got along so well because I was born in Arkansas. He was born in the Ozarks above me in Missouri, both poor, both impoverished. And both and started out after church in rock music. He never went to church. But he went to the Quaker church. And he was so church dumb that the offering played out front, he thought was a place to put his cigar out. So he put a cigar out in the offering place in the Quaker church. So I just want to say, there, if, if you see an offering played out there, it's for money. Just in case. But that's how bad it was. But he found God. And when I got to the vineyard, they wanted to bring me into the vineyard movement because now it went from a small church to a thousand churches around the world. I'm trying to introduce the prophetic, my lowest brother guys, to the vineyard movement and the movement of God and the Pentecostal, Pentecostal craziness in new clothes. And so and it is something that's compatible contemporary to the California lifestyle, which I love that, which, you know, they, they get it, they got it. Instead of saying, that was Jesus, they go, cool. I know you don't get it in Nashville. But anyway, so, so, it was like, <laughs> but what was interesting to me, we would have, there would be 3,000 people in the sanctuary, and everybody's doing that. <laughs> it's like, you know, that looks Pentecostal. No, they were doing it California style, like they sure had one leg. <laughs> I thought they were quaking, surfing, quaking. This doesn't work for none of you, I know, so sorry. God has a way of condescending himself or stooping down to what we can handle as a culture and try to blend the kingdom of God into that until we grow up into something different. God's not afraid of our culture. So miracles and signs and wonders begin to happen there. Cancer, heart trouble, brain tumors. It was amazing. But again, spirit of pride, arrogance. Several leaders met untimely deaths during this season. God spoke to me and about that and how to sidestep that and things that had to do. Movements that excel in divine healing are susceptible to pride and elitism. Be really careful if you have a strong gift. Make sure your flesh is under control. Last 10. And this was all filler to what I want to say, and this, it'll be brief. Er, renewal cocoon. Early to late 1990s, Toronto, not just Toronto, but Brownsville, Rodney Howard Brown, Carpenter's Church, Darren Knotts, Randy Clark, myself, other were involved in renewal, took it globally, renewal as in sense of state churches, non-spirit-filled churches around the nation. I've seen non-spirit-filled state churches under the Spirit of God shaking falling, and I'm going to really mess you up. I was in a meeting so powerful with the anointing of God that children literally, I, God help me, don't throw me, were levitating off of the floor. You could see, what I mean, they were so light in the spirit, they were just floating up from the floor. You could put your hand under them. I wept, and I wept, said, gosh, why not? Jesus floated right up and never came back. And, and, and I, I, then, in just a renewal, I remember it was in uh, uh, Burlington, Vermont. They 
to, to come and bring this renewal to an Assembly of God church that were, did not believe in renewal, didn't have nothing to do with it, didn't want it. They were so, they were so adamant they're going to prove me wrong that God couldn't pour his spirit out and do what he was doing like that with the shaking and the laughing and the crying, the presence of God. And I go there and the place is packed. They're packed out waiting. And all of the AG leaders and superintendents from three states are waiting to see what I'm going to do. But I'm from Arkansas. I improvise. So I said, where are the children? And they said, they're all downstairs. We don't have room for them. I said, how many are down there? They said, about 150. I said, bring them up. They bring up 150 kids in the front. And you could hear a pin drop in the place. I'm sitting next to four district assembly of God, high level men of God who did not like what was going on and wanted to prove that it wasn't God by having me come to put the brakes on so nothing could happen. I thought, adults don't want it. I bet kids do. So I bring 150 kids. 150 kids are there, and I got up and released the Spirit of God on them. Never seen anything like it in my life. Every one of them down there was slain the Spirit, shaking, power, laughing, screaming, praying in tongues. The whole That place was pandemonium. Pandemonium. And I said, God, if not the adults, then the children. And I'm telling you something. If not the adults in this next move of God, then the children. Matter of fact, God delights in that. He said to his disciples, okay, you bunch of high gifted, smart aleck, the kingdom of God. He put the kids in his lap. He said, such is the kingdom of God right here. You guys are great. You're the king, but this is the kingdom. Because kingdom. they were irritated that he was, in a sense, wasting the supernatural on children. Anaheim Vineyard. John decided one Sunday, Larry, what you go minister to the kids? We had 500 kids and their youth at the time back there. Went back there to 500 youth, released the Spirit of God. 500, there, was not, there was one person left standing. I felt sorry for him. 499 were slain the Spirit, and they were all quaking on the floor, shaking. They couldn't stop shaking and quaking. They had to quake their anointing upon them. And the guy that left standing drew a picture of me. He's all these bodies on the floor, and a stick man with a big belly with his hand out. Never liked that kid. I was a little bigger then. But I'm just saying around the world, I have seen that. And get ready. Get ready for a move of God among the children like we have never seen ever, 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 ever. Gosh, the early days of Toronto and Pensacola, gosh, from Sweden to Norway to Denmark to Holland, Australia to Indonesia, around the world, I've seen the most, I've seen the craziest things you can imagine. And I hunger not for the same thing because the river is now in a different place in the stream or in the flow. Not something the same, something more. Something better, something greater, something bigger. The problem, and I'll end with this and close. The problem is that the renewal movement developed an unhealthy attachment to their pet spiritual phenomena. You had to laugh or you had to shake. Or you had, they built, they, do not, do not develop an unhealthy connection or attachment to a certain expression because God is a God of a billion expressions. Don't do that. Let the river flow in your life. Go from glory to glory. Go from one cubit of river of water to another, your perception changing. The, Absolute truth never changes, but your perception of that river will change as you flow down that river. And sooner or later, you'll see the throne of God. That's where it comes and flows. So we're overdue for a move of God. We're way overdue for a move of God. So the last two days, it's 12.08. I promise I'll be, I'm sorry. No, I'm not. It's 12.08. We're overdue for a move of God in the last two nights. The Lord has emphatically spoken to me in my room last night around 10 o'clock again about what he's about to do in this earth. Now, to give you some things, watch out for the Pope. 
Watch for Disney. Watch for Elon Musk. Watch for, there's a lot of things you're going to see that you go, what was that? What's going on in this world? And a good and a bad, there's, cra- cra- there's a bunch of other things I can tell you, but there's some things about to happen that there's no explanation for them right now until it happens. Things are going to happen. Things are going to change. Things are going to change for the worse in some places, for the best in other places. But we're overdue. Point, true revival is unrecognizable at its conception. Nobody saw a baby Jesus and thought the Savior of the world. It was a baby. It threw up. It pooped his pants. Jesus didn't have a Pinky in his mouth, they go, Hail! He just cried. A true move of God is always unrecognizable at his conception. So be really careful about what you criticize. Two, revival is usually rejected by a larger part of the institutional church. Revival has always been rejected by a larger part of the institutional church. Number three, three, True revival is extremely controversial. Controversial. You want to get into a controversy? You want to get into a fight? Try revival. True revival can also be costly. Ask Stephen and Ananias and Sapphira. You've got to be careful with that one because there's a fear of God in true revival, as joyful as it may be. True revival or revival manifestations are to never be worshipped. God is to be worshipped, not manifestation. I'm, I'm, I'm building you an outline for this next move of God, what not to do. True revival, true revival are pride and presumption killers. True revival will kill pride and presumption. If you have pride and presumption, it's not true revival, it's your own revival. Number seven, true revival doesn't place dangerous restrictions on the creativity of God. Who do we think we are to rein in God on his creativity of what he wants to do with people and how he wants them to manifest or express the kingdom of God? Unless it's something, of course, sinful. We know that. I, you know what I'm talking about. We're so darn opinionated about how people are supposed to act and think. If they say it wrong, if they act, if they shake wrong, they do wrong, we're all over it. Like we're the renewal police. True revival doesn't measure today's move of God by yesterday's phenomenon. Don't do that. Nor create the next move of God in the image of the past move of God. Alas, Elijah at Mount Carmel, 1 Kings 19, 11, 13. He says that he goes to the mountain where Moses had met God with this major move of God in the earth, the wind, the fire, the shaking. Oh, my God, what a revival. Elijah says, I'm going to go to that revival. He goes there. And the scripture said, when he's there, God was not in the fire. You can't do what God wants to do contemporary contemporary to who you are now, but what God specifically did in someone else's life in the past. It's about who you are and where you're at now and your uniqueness that only you can express that Moses could not express. I don't want Moses' anointing. I don't want Aaron's anointing. I don't want Elijah's anointing. I don't want Apostle Paul. I want Larry's anointing. Because that's the only one, there's only one of those. And you want your anointing. So Elijah didn't know that. So he goes to the mountain to get Moses' anointing. And 1 Kings 19, 11, 13, but God was not in the fire for him. God was not in the, remember that, the wind for him. But God came to him in a still, small voice in a cave. And from that place, he interacts with God. And he prophesies spring forward for the nation of Israel. He prophesies the placement of kings, and he prophesies the future of what God is about to do. Conclusions? We are at a cocoon transition that looks like nothing we've ever seen before. It is going to be a move of the Spirit of God. Now, it will, each move of God in the past will recognize a peace. They're a soundbite. But just a soundbite of a well-rounded revival that has everything that we need. So the growing controversy, in my opinion, is this. Is it phenomena-based or presence-based? 
Is it gifted based or is it the Spirit of God just phenomenal? It is both and all. It will be the power of God and the Spirit of God. I'm going to leave you with this. And this is, thus saith the Lord. And I hope I live long enough to see it. And some of you will. There's a global renewal. There's a global move of God where it's coming that we are at the very edge of right now. Global. I don't mean just national. I don't mean just a nomination. I mean a global shift. God is about to, can I put it in contemporary? God's about to bust a move on planet Earth. God's had it with all the stuff that's hurting us and what the enemy's doing. What does that mean globally? On this globe, there are 7.5 to 8 billion people. 7.5 to 8 billion people. Of that 8 billion people, only 2.5 billion are Christians. 5 billion are not. A lot of unsaved. Get this. 2.5 Christians our 2.5 of Christianity owns the real estate in our population. God help me here say this. Of the 2.5 Christians, the largest Christian group by far is the Catholic Church. They own 54% of Christianity on the globe. Oh, did I step on a toe? They own 40, high four, uh, excuse me, 50, high 50s of Christianity, percentage-wise. Protestants are 44% of the Christian population. And out of the Protestant movement, there are thousands, if not 10,000s, of sub-denominations. And then under the subs, there's us. I mean, who are a lot kind of charismatic, non-denational, like we're not part. So then out of that, there's 1.5 million in Judaism. This thing is not about you and me anymore. Do you really think that God can stand by and not give away heaven? to one of the largest Christian sectors, the Catholic Church, on this planet without a major move of God? Or do we think we're arrogant enough to own it all? We are a little fish in a big pond. And what God is about to do has been pretty much selective in the charismatic Pentecostal, sub-Pentecostal, whoever, the, all the other thousands of denominations in Protestant Christianity, we're a very small group. We're the minority. You will see God fall on the Catholic global church in a way that hasn't happened in thousands of years. It will provoke the Protestants to jealousy. Healings, miracles, visitations. But it's going to start there, and it's going to end other places. And that is me and you. Because it's not Protestants only, or Pentecostal charismatics. It's whosoever will. For God so loved the charismatics, for God so loved the evangelicals. God so loved the world. And even after that, eight, excuse me, 2.5 billion Catholics, there's still 5 billion unsaved, unchurched people on this planet. So if you'll stand with me, I've been too long, I know. But I don't care. I do care. But I mean, but I don't make apologies is what I'm trying to say. 
I want you to open your heart. And I want to speak into this room and speak into our lives. The transitional anointing that is at our, it's time. It's at our feet. It's at our, it's at our hands. It is time. The John says, and I saw heaven come down from earth like a great city. I saw heaven come down to earth. And Lord, I pray that you would send heaven to earth. Lord, how can you stand it? You die for the whole world. Every denomination. Every unsaved person. You died for eight billion people on this planet. And a few thousand of us cannot cannot just selfishly think we're going to take the lion's share of what you're doing. No. You're so big, you're so wonderful. So amazing. Jesus, you're the high priest, it says in the book of Hebrews, who forever lives to make intercession for the saints of God. You're after the order of Aaron, who had all 12 of the tribes of Israel on his breastplate, and he carried all the denominations of that time on his heart before the Lord. He was partial to not one, but he carried all. He carried upon his heart. He carried their iniquity upon his heart before the Lord. And he carried them before the Lord with equality. God, would you expand us? Would you open us? Would you break through our limited thinking, our staleness, our sense of smallness? Lord, would you break through the little stuff and all the crazy stuff that's kept us from advancing to a global impact from heaven. Let it be this generation. Let it be the generation after me. Let it be, God, let it be, let it be. And Lord, I ask that in whatever way that you would want to do it, I don't know how, because the river changes from glory to glory to glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord, or at least the look of the river, at least the place of the river, or at least the velocity and texture of the river. So Lord, we pray that we don't know what you want to do other than we know that you love people. And that for such a reason Jesus came was to save the world. 2,000 years later he's still on the job. And the Holy Spirit is still working and putting together the package of salvation, the package of the power of God to transform a planet that we can call it for the kingdoms of this world have now become the kingdoms of the Lord in His Christ. And Lord, I speak into that. I pull that into the now. I thank you for all these past moves of God. As much crazy as, as we've had to endure with it, it's all right when your children, parents laugh, but you're no longer laughing, Lord. We're grown now. And at this place and at this time, you're asking us to square our shoulders. And like the prodigal son said, I will arise and go to my father's house and I'll act like an adult. And Lord, we arise from the places that we have been of selfishness, of running from God, of, of limited time, limited space. And we run to the father's house because he's on the front porch waiting for us to embrace us, to give us. So Lord, as I speak into this group, I speak an anointing of the Holy Spirit I speak to you, every person in this room, tonight when you go to sleep, may the Holy Spirit fill you with dreams of good things. May God speak to you. May God touch your spirit. May God open you to not just your little thing or your little group, but to the world and to all of God's people. May God put Aaron's breastplate on you that you represent, that you love, that you make no difference between all of the tribes of Israel. In other words, between all of the denominational expressions, between all the people of God who have different understandings, Lord, because you are one God, and you said your job is to make them one people and one church. And that church is your church on this earth. God, we stand at the precipice. We stand at the very, the very edge of this crazy cliff that we're about to jump off of into an expression of renaissance and revival that the world hasn't experienced since 2,000 years ago. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
Not only shall America be saved, this world shall be saved. You promised it. You promised it, Lord. Every eye shall behold you. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Lord, you promised that. You promised that you would send your Holy Spirit on all nations and all peoples and all tongues. You promised that, Lord. And we agree with you right now. We no longer just have church. We become the church. We become everything that we have theologized about and learned about. We are now grown and growing up into your love, into your kingdom, and into a place of release, into a place of embrace. Lord, thank you for that. Now, here it comes. I just want to put your hand up. Put your, maybe two hands, one hand, two hands up. I just want you to put them up. I just want, I just felt this wind of God blowing through this place. A wind of the Spirit. Because that's what happened on the day of Pentecost. And there came the sound of a mighty rushing wind that filled the place. And they were filled with the Spirit of God. Lord, let your breath, let the exhale of heaven. You have been waiting to exhale for 2,000 years. Exhale, God, upon your bride. Exhale upon your church and let this exhale be heard and felt in such a way that as with the day of Pentecost it was great noise and great excitement and great prophetic expression that happened all the way out into the streets of the cities that they were in this is your day Lord this is your world this is your church we are your people it is not about us it is about you it's about your agenda not our agenda it is about who you are not who we are to become it is about you it is about your love for the world. So we thank you for that. Lord in Jesus' name.